I forgot to press the record button twice in a single lecture. So this is another part where I do the voiceover over a still frame. We start by solving the moon base example that I assigned just after the break. The first thing we need to answer this question is we want to calculate the efficient allocation K star. This efficient allocation looks quite trivial in our case. So if we denote by zero the not building a moon base and by one the decision to build a moon base, then our decision will be to build the moon base, so k star of theta will be equal to 1, if the sum of all citizens' valuations is above c. And we will not build the moon base if the sum of all citizens' valuation valuations is below c, uh, is below the cost, where the cost is this 500 million benchmark. Now it's been pointed out during the lecture that I phrased the problem in a, incorrectly. I said that all citizens have valuation theta i. What I meant to say is that citizen i has valuation theta i. So it is not necessarily the case that all citizens have same valuation theta i. They can all have different valuations and these valuations are, you can assume, independent. So one way to write this efficient allocation k star is to say that, well, we sum all players' valuations. So this sum is for i from 1 to n. And we denote the cost of the project by some c. So this 500 million cost is our c. An alternative way to phrase it is to use theta 0 to denote the, the designer's valuation for the project to capture any social costs that are not individually appropriated by the participants. Namely, we can set theta zero to be the minus 500 million representing the cost of the project. And in that case, we can uh, rephrase this condition of the project not being worth it to say that the sum of theta i's for i from 0 to n is less than 0. Another question that came up during this discussion is about the tie-breaking rules. Namely, what should we do when the sum of citizens' valuations is exactly 500 million? So when this inequality and this inequality, they hold with equality. Should we adopt, should we implement the project? Should we not do it? And the answer is, you decide. It does not matter which tie-breaking rule we choose. The final outcome we will rarely depend on it. At least in the problems that we consider. So you can say that when uh, the nation is indifferent, the project is not implemented. You can say that it is implemented. You can say that the project is implemented with some probability. Once again, it generically, it generally will not matter which tie-breaking rule you choose. Now we can go to actually calculating the growth transfers in this problem. Namely, if we just plug in all the values that we had here, into our expression for growth transfers, what we will obtain is given by this expression here. So growth transfers, since they are not on this on this uh, picture, are given by the minus sum of valuations of all players except for i when we are calculating ti the minus sum of vj's for all j not equal to i from the efficient allocation k star. In this case, 
when we assume that all players, except for the designer, obviously, when all players value the project at 100, we will get that this negative sum of utilities is given by minus V0, the designer's valuation for the project, which is given by minus 500 million. So this will be minus minus 500 million. And then from all other participants, from the citizens, we will have this 6,999,999 elements, VIs, VJs, and each of these VJs from the efficient allocation will be given by 100. Because the efficient allocation case star for this theta is 1. So for this valuation profile, we are implementing the project. So the sum of all agents' valuations is given by exactly this. It's given by minus 500, well, negative of this. It's given by minus 500 million from the social costs. And then the plus 100 times 7 million minus 1 from the citizens' valuations. Once we sum up all these terms, we will get that the final social benefit for everyone except for player i, net of the social costs, is given by 200 million kroner minus 100. Namely, Grove's transfers in this problem imply that every player, every citizen, will receive a payment of almost 200 million kroner. And this payment is there to provide incentives to report truthfully. So what we have is that the total cost of providing incentives will be 7 million citizens times just shy of 200 million kroner to each citizen. This will be a number with uh, 6, 12, 15 zeros. Well, maybe 14 zeros. So this is an exorbitant sum, and this is many orders of magnitude larger than the actual cost of the project. So we see that while Grove's transfers, formally speaking, do the job of providing incentives to report truthfully, they are far from perfect. They may give us such nonsensic numbers, and we want to do something with it. And what we can do with it is we can use the term hi of theta minus i that we just randomly set to zero because we did not know what it is. The point is this term captures any transfers that do not depend on player i's report. But they, these transfers give us a lot of degrees of freedom. So we can exploit this term to countervail these growth transfers. In particular, we can set this hi of theta minus i to be something on the same order of magnitude as tig. And here comes the second big uh, recipe that I'm giving to you today, which is the Clark transfers. Clark came up with something called the pivot mechanism, which used the following shape of hi of theta minus i. In particular, he said that since we want to counterbalance the sum of all VJs from the efficient mechanism, we can use something like the similar sum from the almost efficient allocation. The problem is, the efficient allocation obviously depends on player I's report. So how can, the efficient, how can we find something that's close to the efficient allocation that does not depend on player I's report? And there are many ways to do this. If anything, again, different textbooks will give you different interpretations of this uh, issue. What we will do in this course is we will introduce the almost efficient allocation k star of theta minus i. And so while this is also called k star, this is an abuse of notation, it is not the same object as k star of theta. So this k star of theta minus i is the allocation 
that maximizes the welfare of all players except for I. So this is the argmax over allocations K of the sum of real utilities VJ for, for all players except for I, including the designer here, of, well, yeah, VJs of K and theta J. So this is the real allocation that maximizes the welfare if we ignore the well-being of player I. And it is quite reasonable that this that the sum of VJs from this almost efficient allocation will be relatively similar in magnitude and in sign and in all other respects to the K star of theta. So if we use this HI of theta minus I and if we plug into Grove's transfers, we will get the what is called VCG transfers. And they are written here. So transfers prescribed by the VCG mechanism are given by the Grove's term. So minus the sum of VJs for all J not equal to I. So the sum of real utilities of all other players from K star of theta, from the actual efficient allocation, given all the players' reports. And then plus the sum of real utilities of all other agents from this almost efficient allocation k star of theta minus i. To see that VCG prescribes reasonable transfers, let us calculate the VCG transfers for the moon base problem that we have just considered. Okay, transfers, VCG transfers, moon base. What's happening? What are the transfers? You would say zero because k is one in both cases, and this is correct. Yes. Excluding one person would still have the sum of valuations of all players above 500 million or above zero. So this k star and this k star are the same, meaning that these two sums of valuations will also be the same, meaning that it will be zero in the moon base example. Good. So, VCG is the solution for a lot of our troubles. We should be using that until we aren't. So what's the idea? The idea behind VCG transfer. I gave you the expressions, I have not told you what they mean. As we've just seen, in this moon base example, the VCG transfers say that player I has a non-zero transfer, so either has to pay something to the mechanism or is paid something by the mechanism, if and only if these two k's are different. Right? Otherwise, these sums of valuations are the same. So what this means is that player I must pay only if his preferences, his type theta I, affects the allocation that we implement. So the way to see it, or further way to see it, the way to see it further, is to say this case star of theta minus I is what would happen if you just reported nothing. If you report nothing and say the mechanism presumes you do not exist, so your preferences are not taken into account. It's like I'm doing surveys. I guess I've not done surveys yet. I will be doing surveys. But if you do not report, your preferences are un unaccounted for, right? They do not affect the allocation key star. So why would you have a ch why would you want to report? You want to report only to ship this decision key star in your favor. And what this will do, presumably, at least in the in case of efficient thing, is you want to shift the decision in your favor, and that will likely be at the expenses of everyone else. So this means that when you do this, you will have to pay the externality that your effect on the decision has on everyone else. Yeah, so that's why it's called the pivot mechanism. You only pay if you are pivotal in the decision made. In our example, nobody was pivotal, so no single 
or no single citizen was, was able to ruin the project of the moon base. So BCG says that they all should pay zero. Right. So yeah, uh, another thing is I said that if you're affecting the decision, it's likely to, to benefit you and to the expense of everyone else, and then you have to pay, right? This is reasonable in many settings. For example, in the auction, you want to bid for the item if you expect to win, which means that somebody else will not get it. Uh, or in the, in the decision, for example, in this moon base, you will want to report to ruin the moon base for everyone, which means that you'll have a huge negative externality on everyone, so you'll have to pay them a lot to compensate them for the moon base that you ruin for them. But this is not necessarily the case. In some cases, we can say that the presence of the agent is uh, beneficial for everyone else. For example, if we need, say, 10 people to start a course, and we have nine volunteers, then the 10th volunteer will mean that the course is organized for everyone. So the presence of the 10th volunteer will uh, in, in impose a positive externality on everybody else. So in this case, that person will receive uh, money from the mechanism in, and if there are exactly 10 volunteers then each of these people will receive money from the mechanism because every one of them is pivotal is necessary for the decision to be implemented okay that's about VCG let's practice some more because I feel like you're slacking off and not computing the transfers I am asking you to compute Let us consider the following example. We have one item and potential bidders. Bidder I has valuation theta I for the item. And the designer has uh, no value for the item. The designer has this item. Give me the VCG transfers for this problem, for this selling problem, for this auction, if you want. Now, just before you do it, one error warning. I know that some of you already know what it is, right? You can already see what the transfers will be. You can already see what this auction will look like. I want you to forget everything you know and apply the expressions. Go. You have three minutes. Okay. Let us begin. So, what do we need to begin with? What do we start with? To calculate the transfers, we need to calculate something else first. What do we need to do? Altogether, we need to calculate Efficient allocation. Good. I want everyone to support Johan next time around. <laughs> so, K of theta will be what? I have not told you how we should write K in this, um, um, in this problem. So let us say that, well, you can obviously do many different things. You can say that K star K is the identity of the person, so K is I. Or you can write that k is uh, k1, kn, and each k here is the probability that agent i gets the item. So let's go with uh, this interpretation. And we will just write ki star theta for generic player i. So our player can get the item, cannot get the item, and again there can be some tie breaks. So when does the player get the item? When he has the highest valuation. So let's say if theta i is strictly greater than max over all other players of theta j. Good, makes sense, right? The player does not get the item if the opposite happens, right? If theta i is not the highest valuation in the population theta j 
So in this case, ties are a little bit tricky because we're writing this for generic KI. So I guess we cannot really put this equality into either of these two cases, right? If we put the equality here, then in case of a tie, we'll say that many different people will have to get the item of probability one, which is not feasible. Here, in case of a tie, if I put the equality here, say that in case of a tie, nobody gets the item, which is inefficient. So we'll have to say that one over one over m. <laughs> if theta i is exactly equal to the max of j not equal to i, theta j, and m here is the the power of the set of the maximum. How, how can you write here? Yeah. Okay. So please. So to, to, to re reiterate the question for, for some people, can we just argue that distributions distribution of thetas is continuous, and so then ties happen with probability zero? So you can assume that, but that, that will not solve the issue, right? Because we still need to specify the allocation rule if ties happen. It's just by that logic, uh, any realization of theta has zero probability, so we, do not, we would not need to specify k for theta, right? That's obviously not the way to go. Okay, so we specified this. Uh, we actually need to specify some other thing, which is the vj. Good. Uh, yeah, what we kind of do, I did not specify it. I should have specified this part of the problem, right? As well as specification of k. But I did not, so let's write it here. So what is vj of k and theta? k times theta, yeah. So player j gets theta, theta j, importantly. OK, this should be theta j as well, right? Gets theta j if they get the item, with the probability that they get the item. k, so k j. j. Good point. All right, but I had something different in mind. K star of theta minus i, that's exactly what I had in mind, right? It might confuse you that I'm using K star for both of these, um, but these are actually different objects, so I am abusing the notation quite a bit. So K star of theta minus i is a collection of n objects for every i. And in our case, this almost efficient allocation, the efficient ignoring layer i allocation will be given by, you can guess what it is, right? We give it to the high, to the person with the highest valuation who is not i. And we never give it to player i. I will not write it down because it will take another 15 minutes. Good. Now, we are as close as we ever have been to actually writing the VCG transfers. So has anyone gotten so far as to actually derive those transfers? So let's let's do it case by case. Yeah. Uh, let's consider separately the case when I win, wins and the case when I loses. So again, we're ignoring uh, if there's a tie. We will not write it here. Okay, so the claim was that the sum of valuations for everyone, including i, uh, if i wins, will be theta i. And this second term will be the second highest theta. But this is not the sum for everyone, including i. So we just have to make one adjustment, right? So that's zero. That's zero. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's exactly it. So if i wins, so this will be their valuation. So theta, um, uh, let's say, Two in brackets. That's the convention in auction. The second highest value, the second order statistic, if you like. And if i loses, what happens? That's exactly right. So there is no difference whether i is in the auction or not. We know that the person with the highest valuation theta gets the item in this allocation and in this allocation as well. So it will be the same person since i is never the person with the highest valuation. So these two. Sums should be exactly the same, so this will be zero. 
So we see that player I pays nothing if player I loses. We see that player I pays the second highest valuation if player I wins. So this is our favorite second price auction. Also known as, does anyone know? Vickery auction. And this is the V in here. So Vickery is the guy who came up with the second price auction, claiming that it's all good and stuff. And uh, you see that that's exactly the VCG mechanism here, or the pivot mechanism for the case of an auction. Okay, let us resume whatever we did. What did we do? Okay, yeah. So, we've designed the VCG mechanism. After three people who contributed different parts of it to each other. And uh, so the VCG transfers allow us to support the efficient allocation. And they're kind of same, right? So end of the road? Maybe not. Let's consider another example. This is the example day, and I'm not even I did not even do all the examples that I wanted to. So this is a common problem, or at least a popular problem, called bilateral trade. Very similar to what we just did, but very similar but slightly different. We have a seller uh, with an item, with an item, and valuation theta s, let's say it's, I don't know, do we need to, for some reason I said it's between 0 and 1. I don't think it matters, but making changes on the fly never paid off once, not once. But the buyer can potentially want the item, uh, also has some valuation theta b also say between 0 and 1 for the same unknown reason. I want you to just take a minute to meditate on this problem, on the expression for PCG transfers, on the Vickery auction that we just saw, talk to your neighbor and say what will be the transfers here and what will be the difference from the second price auction that we just did. Let's, let's do things already. What is the efficient allocation here? So k star, I'm writing this maximally informally. I'm, I'm teaching you bad things for the exam, but I will say that k star of theta is trade. You can say that it's again 0 and 1, the probability of trade. So trade if um, theta b is greater than theta s, so the buyer has higher valuation, and no trade Otherwise, yeah, let's see. We do not trade as one, no trade as zero. Again, you can break the tie arbitrarily. Okay. You can say that there is trade, there is no trade. If the, valu the valuations are equal, you can say that they trade with some probability. I'm just picking one of the efficient allocations. That's one of the reasons where, why for k star of theta I wrote, it belongs to the R max. Here I kind of I chose to use this notation to define it, but you can also say that it's one of the elements that maximizes. But yeah, you usually have some multiplicity there, uh, but you can it does not really matter which one you pick. Okay, so this is this. Um, now a slightly I don't know if it's a trickier question or not. Let's say k star of Theta B. So if we ignore the seller's welfare, what is the efficient thing to do then? The efficient thing to do. Yes, to trade. We do not care about the seller's valuation for the item, so we just always give it to the buyer who values it at some non-negative amount. I guess that's why it matters that thetas are positive at least. And by analogy, K star of theta S. 
so if we do not care about the buyer's welfare, then we don't trade. No trade. Okay, cool. The question is, I don't know if people on Zoom heard it. If, uh, if we only care about seller's welfare, you said, then it's still optimal to sell the item if buyer uh, sells, if buyer values it more than the seller. So, you know, maybe this is something richer. Except we are talking about case stuff. What is case stuff? In our case, K is who has the item in their pocket, in their hands. K has nothing to do with money. In your logic, trade is profitable here because the seller gets money from trade. But in this mechanism, in this allocation, there is no money. So we are maximizing these VJs, the real utilities, from possessing the item. So K star from theta minus B, let's write it. Minus B will be the arc max over K of what? Of V S of K theta S. V S in our case is just arc max over K of K S, uh, the probability that seller gets the item, but since we denote it as a trade or no trade, 1 minus K. K is the probability of trade. Uh, 1 minus K times theta S. So just this real utility from the allocation. No monetary terms here. We are maximizing the seller's utility from having the item. It's obviously, it's better for the seller to have the item than to not have the item. That's why there is no trade, and we just leave the item with the seller. Okay, okay, okay. Now, yet again, we need to find the VCG transfers. So let's write what will be the transfer for the buyer, what will be the transfer for the seller. Again, they will be conditional, you know, if trade, if no trade, I will just write them in a particular way. So what are the transfers? And now I want you to look very closely at this problem. And I want you to look very closely at the problem that we did before the break, the auction. And I want you to tell me what is different between the two. OK, you're going in the right direction. So the answer was, the difference is here the trade only happens if the buyer has higher valuation than the seller. While in the previous uh, question, the trade only happened always because the seller, who was the designer, never valued the item. So it was always optimal to give it to one of the uh, buyers. But thing is, here, both the seller and the buyer are players in the mechanism. They are not the, none of them is the designer. The designer is some third party, the platform, right? While before, so here in this problem, one of these players still ends up with the item in the end, regardless. So it is the same as in the previous problem. And so my answer is, there is no difference. This is exactly the same problem. And these labels are here to confuse you, to lead you down the false path. We do not, we can call this the God, and we can call the buyer um, Alex. Nothing will change, it will still be the same problem. So the fact that we call them seller and the buyer does not really matter here, right? So you can argue, of course. The difference is the initial allocation of property rights, if I can say that. So the difference is that in the previous problem, the item was initially with the designer, and here it is initially with the seller. But we do not have initial property rights in the mechanism. Mechanism only prescribes the final allocation. We do not care about which K we started with. So the transfers will be exactly the same 
as we just had. So the buyer will pay the seller's valuation uh, if the buyer gets the item. So in the case of trade, and I use this notation for indicators, right? One, if the condition is true, zero, if the condition is false. And uh, theta B, sorry, the seller will have to pay theta B if there is no trade. So if the seller ends up with the item. And now you tell me, is this a good mechanism? Yeah, so, so. The problem is the seller has to pay to keep the item and gets nothing from selling the item. Would the seller want to participate in this kind of mechanism? I wouldn't. So we need, uh, we need to do something with that. And to do that, in the rest of today, and apparently a lot of next week, because I'm going a lot slower than I expected, we will talk about the two requirements that we might have for the mechanisms. This property that we wish we had in this bilateral trade problem is called individual rationality, or what we will call individual rationality. So, definition. Individual rationality. We will say that a mechanism gamma is, so there will be two options. It can be interim individually rational, which I will just write as IR. If the players want to participate in the mechanism initially, so they do not know what anyone's types are, they might know, they do know their own type, but that's it. So if expectation over theta minus i of the utility ui, theta i, theta minus i, yeah. Okay, I should write x here. Utility is a function of an allocation of type, so u is xi. Utility of x theta i, uh, theta minus i, and the type profiles theta i theta minus i. And this whole expectation of this whole utility is non-negative. No, sorry, no, 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 no. Pause. It used to be non-negative. Now it's above the outside option called u underline i theta i. So this is the outside option for type theta i. This is the utility that type i gets from not participating in the mechanism. The second version of the property is called ex post. Individually rational. And we will say that our mechanism is exposed individually rational if, even after learning all the types and learning of the final allocation, our player i is not willing to walk out of the, of the mechanism. So if uh, I forgot to put the quantifiers here, so in the interim IR we had any theta i. And that's it. Exposed IR if ui of x theta i theta minus i. Yes, we need any i here as well. Sorry about that. I do need to be more formal. Right? Okay, the mechanism is exposed IR if this utility is greater than the outside option u bar i theta i for any player i, for any type of the player i, and for any profile of types of the other players. 
the idea of these definitions is, you know, pretty obvious from looking at them. Player's utility from participating in the mechanism and getting allocation X prescribed by the mechanism should be above the outside option, which is what the agent would get if they do not participate in the mechanism, right? Cool. I hope that a lot of you, or all of you by now, are familiar with such words as interim and exposed, which if you use them outside of econ classes, everyone will tell that you're an economist. Right, but if you still don't, then you must, because how else will you like, reveal yourself as an economist? So we'll, we use three terms extensively, and these terms refer to the timing of our kind of meta game. So this is a refresher, or partially a definition. So we'll have three points in time. We'll have ex ante, before all of the game. And ex ante is a such a point in time in which no player knows anyone's type. So, um, I does not know theta i or theta minus i. Interim perspective is somewhere in between the game. So this is kind of the point in time at which the player, at which the mechanism is formulated but not yet run. So here, every player I knows their own type. They know what this type means. They know how they value the item and so on. But they still do not know everyone else's types. So this is the stage at which player I basically chooses what to report. Exactly is the stage at which we design a mechanism. So at the interim stage, I knows theta I, but not theta minus I. Okay, and finally, exposed is after all is said and done, the mechanism is run, the reports are made, the allocation is revealed. So at that point, player I knows theta I, and player knows what everyone else reported. So the player I knows theta minus I, presuming that everyone else reported truthfully. Yes, question on Zoom. Yes, exactly. The expectation that we take in the interim IR is over all other player types. is over theta minus i. It is conditional on everything player i knows at that stage, which is theta i, which is important in case types are correlated. So this is a good point. Thank you. And this, yeah, this leads us to the point at which distributions of types actually start to matter. Before now, everything was domain strategy instead of compatible, so we just did not care about everyone else's types. Right, okay. And this is one requirement in two different forms that we can have towards our mechanism. Is this requirement particularly strong on its own? Can we just have some trivial solution which solves it? just like we had at the beginning, where we did not constrain the sum of transfers to be zero over all ages. We had a trivial solution to just print money and make everyone happy. What is the, this trivial solution here? How can we make the mechanism individually rational? The suggestion is to make the outside option minus infinity. Good point, except the outside option is a fixed. It's a property of the player or their type, to be precise. So this will be a part of the environment that we did not specify before. But you're thinking in the right direction. If we cannot make this outside option minus infinity, what else can we do? In the quasi-linear setting, for example. Just give them all money. Simple. You have access to money, you give them all money, your, your mechanism will run a deficit, so the designer will lose a lot of money, but you'll make a mechanism that's individually rational. So we need some counterweight here. So we will have another requirement that usually goes hand in hand with individual rationality, which is budget balance. Mechanism 
gamma is exactly budget balanced if the expectation over all players types of the sum from 1 to n of all players transfers um, okay I'll finish this and then I will write the part that's missing if this expectation is non negative, meaning that on average the players pay money to the mechanism if you take expectation over all players' time. In this case, it might be the case that in some cases the mechanism loses money, sometimes the mechanism makes money, but on average it makes money. Uh, and the alternative is we can have exposed budget balance. If we do not want to have those contingencies where we lose money, we just require that this sum of transfers is non negative for every theta. Okay, and the missing qualifier that I must have here is in the quasi linear setting. It's the one that we are kind of implicitly working in uh, throughout, throughout most of today, throughout all of today. But uh, individual rationality can, in principle, be applied to general setting, right? So here we have general access. We do not have anything particular specific to transfers. So you can again add note here that in the general setting. So the important part of the restriction, that the, the subtle part of this restriction, is that indices go from one. We know that if the indices, that if we sum up all transfers for i from zero to n, we will get exactly zero because that's what we assumed. So another way to write these restrictions would be, for example, to say that t zero of theta is less than or equal to zero. So our designer gets money here in either for all theta or in expectation over theta. Now, okay, the quick trick question is um, we said we introduced three points in time, but we only have two versions of every definition. Uh, does it make sense to add the missing version of every definition? So part one, does it make sense to have an ex ante IR? Would it be a meaningful restriction? In some settings, not all settings, but in some settings. Yeah, so we, we, we do assume that the individual always knows uh, their own type, but we have never really talked about the decision to participate in the mechanism at all, right? So we have never even looked at this example setting. But in principle, in principle, it could make sense to have a distribution of thetas and uh, for a player to not know their exact type before they decide to participate in the mechanism or not. And I should have an example for that, but I did not come up with one. Uh, so what would be a good example for when player does not know their type before coming into the mechanism? Uh, I guess you sign up to do some work, and here the player is the employee, who, or the contractor who does that work, and your theta is the cost to you from doing that work, but you do not know exactly what the work is going to, exactly your cost before you get to see the actual amount of work that you get to do. And you do not get to see that properly before you decide, before you sign up for it. So that could be one example where Exante um, IR could make sense. Although it would be a question of whether theta i would then be drawn from the same distribution as the designer assumes it is. Okay, and quickly, interim budget balance. Budget balance. Does this make sense? So the answer was, it only makes sense for the designer. But uh, yeah, but the budget balance is kind of the restriction for the designer, right? So it's, it's not that we're excluding one random agent from the sum, we're always excluding player zero, and uh, it's always the restriction for the designer. Uh, but, yeah. So the answer was that 
uh, interim and exposed are the same because thetas have been realized. I kind of half agree with that. I would say that exante and interim are the same for the designer because in both cases, the designer does not know player's types and uh, the, the designer himself never has a non-trivial information in our, in our model, in our assumptions. So, okay, um, I actually wanted to move one slide further to give you a hint of what's gonna happen next week. But uh, the, the hint is we will be talking next week about whether there exist mechanisms that are always or sometimes individually rational and are budget balanced. And uh, in particular, we will use this bilateral trade example a lot. So here in bilateral trade example, the VCG mechanism was not IR. So can we make it IR? Will it be budget balanced? Will it not be? This is what we'll do next week. And what we did today, we said, you know, what if a given allocation, what if a given outcome rule, social choice function, is not implementable in itself? But we have access to money. Can we find such transfers that support it? And we did. So this is the main thing that we did today. We said that even if some social choice function is not implementable in itself, you can always find transfers that support it if you can, if you are allowed to use transfers. 